Bow with me for just a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day and for allowing us to be a part of it. We have just pledged our allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Help us, Father, to continue to make that flag show a country that is proud of being able to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We're here today to honor those who have provided our safety and the fact that we have kept this country alive and well. Thank you, Father, for this meal. Thank you for this opportunity to be together. In God's name we pray. Amen. It's my pleasure to introduce to you a person that you already know really well. Mark Browning is standing around here someplace, and he has programs and announcements and all kinds of good things to tell you. Thank you. Mark? This is the guy that puts this together, and we really ought to thank him and say we appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, for, thank you for showing up. Can you hear in the back? Can you hear me? Okay, if you can't hear in the back, tell me. We'll speak it up or we'll do something. All right, uh, my name is Mark Browning. Before we get started, we've got a, a gift to give. Uh, we've got a guy in the front row over here. His name's uh, Eric Schwanker. And he turned 99 last month and I missed his birthday. So we got some cookies for him and stuff. He's only 99. So come on up here, Eric, get this present. Eric's given us some talks up here before, and uh, he had Judy had us move his couch one time. It was about two, three years ago. It was about, about probably 50 feet, and I was panting in a huff, and I couldn't move. And he wasn't even panting up, and he can only do 100 push-ups a day. Now, I, I haven't been doing that for a while. This is Eric Schrenker. Happy birthday, Eric. Glad to have you here, Dave. It's raining out a little bit, but it's going to stop a little bit. But if you're women, if you need a valet, we got valet here to get you back to your car so you don't get to mess, hair, mess that hair up. We don't mess that hair up because it might cost the men some money. A um, couple of, several announcements here. We got uh, this is our executive director here to my left. This is uh, Forrest Gottman, and uh, he's been with us for a couple of months now. And he, you got any uh, suggestions for him? He'll make it happen. Whatever you think should be improved here, tell us, and he'll uh, make sure some of that happens. Um, we got a bunch of things going on this next month. I'd like to tell you about a few things. I'm gonna put my slide projector, but uh, I don't have it up there, so we'll get up there after the talk. Uh, we'll turn the slide projector off so it doesn't bother anything, if you don't mind. Um, the, what we got going on here in May, this is called the Amazon Wartime Museum. Some of you have been here before. If you haven't been here, bring some other people next time. If you've been here before, bring some people next time. Love to have you. Uh, but in May, May 19th, we've got Bossy Field. We're going to be the main sponsor for the Bossy Field baseball. It's called Thirsty Thursday. And that's $1 beer. So if you want to uh, drink some beer, they got beer there that night. But we're going to help sponsor that uh, baseball game. Love to have you there that night. May 28th is a Saturday. And it's going to be a big deal here. That's our fifth anniversary. May 25th, not 5th, 28th. May 28th is it. The Saturday before Memorial Day. Memorial Day is a big day on Monday the 30th. And uh, that day we're going to have uh, uh, private pilots flying you. And anybody wants to donate some money to the museum, and they'll fly you around and circle over the city. And uh, we still have some open seats in that. We have uh, all the pilots have more than 500 hours, many more hours than that and they're safe planes, they're all private planes. We did it last year, people just loved it. A lot of people who never flown before got a front seat of that. But that's on May 28th. Uh, in uh, ju 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 July, ju July, let's see, uh, July uh, 15th, 16th, 17th, I believe the dates are right. We've got a B-52 coming in here, and you get on that plane, and you can walk around that plane. What did you say there, Larry? Okay, B-25, B-25, that was the one that did the Doolittle Run, and we got a copy of that right over on those ships over there. There's a Hornet, it's an aircraft carrier with 16, 14 B-25s on that little, it's a little uh, display over there. We got a B-25, that was part of Doolittle Run, and you'll be able to get on that plane, walk around it, and there's still rides left. If you want to ride, uh, you're more than welcome to pay for rides to fly around this city in a B-25. 
25. That's B as in bomb. Then um, in uh, September, September 22nd, uh, Rich Hockensmith somehow got these people to uh, get us a B-29. There's only one left flying in the world. It's also called the Fifi. There's only one left flying right now in the world. It's the same type of plane that dropped the atom bomb, two atom bombs in Nolan Gray. So you won't get to see that very often. It's going to be out here right in front of the hangar over here, hopefully right on the uh, uh, taxiway, and you'll be able to get on that plane. It's only going to be here one day. There's also going to be a B-24. That's what they made up at Will Run. They made a whole bunch of them World War II. They made one every 63 minutes up there, and then they got a steerman, and we've got one other plane coming. Three of the planes will be able, all planes will be able to ride in them. The B-29, I think, is already sold out. Now, what do I miss, Donna? Anything I missed on the announcements? A date Who? A date. A date. For which one of them? Okay, the plane coming is B-25 coming in on July 15, 16, 17. That's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And the B-29 is coming on, on September 22nd. That's a Thursday. Be here only one day. B-29, you'll never see. It's 141 feet wide. It's a gigantic thing. Drop the ad, the type plane drop the atom bomb. Okay, that's enough of those announcements. We got this series of talks going on. I'm not going to announce all the people. We got a lot of good talkers coming down the road. Next month, we do have the chaplains, and Jennifer should be sending you a handout if you want to come to hear the chaplains. We've got three very experienced chaplains talking about what a chaplain does during the war. He'll talk 12 minutes, then what they do after the war, and then what they do even post-war, even with hostage situations. They are very experienced chaplains. They're all in their 50s or 60s, two of them on active duty, one in charge of a lot of VA uh, institutions here in, in Indiana. So I would like you to be here a month from now, the first Thursday, of June. And I don't think I've forgotten anything now. Now the next, I gotta uh, tell about our, uh, we've got some remodels here. We've got a library upstairs. We'll have it open to the public pretty soon. We've got the best collection of any war books in the world, right in the, in the state, Tri-State area, right upstairs. 2,300 books have been donated to us and we have them in certain order and we will allow you to check them out at some time in the near future. No checkouts yet, but it'll be one of the nicer libraries around on war history, all different wars. Uh, we've got simulators back there and uh, a lot of new exhibits that you can look around the museum and, and just uh, be at home. Um, now, I have uh, Brian Bredold. I want to say a few things about him. Brian Bredold, I've only known for 66 years. My wife and I went to kindergarten with him and we're still friends. So he's got a lot of patience. Uh, anyway, but Brian Bredold's a good friend. He helps fix all the locks here, and if you need a locksmith, he can fix the locks. He doesn't work on any banks, so he can't get any banks, but he works on private houses. Um, he also is a CB. A CB, I didn't know what a CB was, but he's been in a lot of the talks here that we had on CBs. Very interesting about CBs. He's uh, also, uh, we had a movie on him in our main lobby for about three years. He describe what all these guns were in these cases and how we made the bullets here at Chrysler. And it was a very well done video and he did, and he was on the movies here for three years. He didn't go to Hollywood after that, just stayed here in Evansville. Uh, but uh, Brian was an altar boy with me, also an Eagle Scout, and his uh, wife friend is here with him and he's been to most of these talks. But he's gonna talk about what I got here in front of me on both sides. And most of us have seen these flags, but he's going to tell you the evolution of these flags and the flags of our services. And I think you'll be much more attuned to what our, all these flags mean in our city and in our world today. We have a flag of Evansville. One of our volunteers is working on a new flag for Evansville. I think the flag of Evansville was made about 1941 or so, and they're trying to do a new type of flag for the city of Evansville that will hopefully be raised up here at some time. He's going to talk about all these flags on the ground here, but these 14 flags above me are the flags, the 14 flags of our allies in World War II. And each one of these allies did a tremendous amount in a World War II effort for the uh, American, uh, English, and uh, French effort, but it was all these other countries, not just theirs. So I'll quit talking. Brian, your, your show. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to thank the museum for allowing me to come out here and 
trying to show you a little bit about Doesn't work. Hey, microphone right next to your mouth. Microphone doesn't work. It'll work. It'll work. Yeah, just keep it close. About an inch from your mouth, Brian. That's what we're trying to do anyway. The uh, history goes back probably over 2,000 years to over 1,000 uh, BC. They were invented in China to begin with. And uh, the Chinese had white flags. Usually they had a, like a red bird or a blue dragon on it. And it was uh, a very sacred thing. If uh, they had an underling came along, they had to lower their colors to make the flag. From there in the same continent, in India, they had flags there and they came about just about the same time. Usually the Indian flags were triangular and they Yeah, the flags were scarlet or green. They usually had uh, a figure in there that on them were in gold. And they most of the time had gold on like a set of flags. Okay, that better? Anyway, uh, displayed in front of you, I've got all the military services up here. Uh, there is a little bit of some of it. The flags are arranged according to the uh, it first came into being. On my far right. Hey, Brian. Just. Put the microphone down and yell. Like <laughs> flag on the far right is the National Guard flag. Now the National Guard was in existence before we were a nation. They were usually from the states or the regions. The first one being Massachusetts. It actually came into being 1636. So we have National Guard here long before we became a nation. That's all right. Just leave it as is. Okay, the next one was the Army. They came into being in June of 1775. We were just starting to really get organized as a nation. And the Continental Congress had not convened yet. But they decided we had to have an army to protect ourselves. So 1775, the army came into being. The crest on there is from the first crest that they had back at that time frame. That's why that flag is, is like it is. Got another one? Thank you. That's the man, man. We'll see. <laughs> okay. In October, October 13th. October 13th of 1775, the United States Navy was formed. Here we go. I guess those spreaders aren't working so good. The uh, ship on there is actually the, the uh, first ship, but that was not the first flag. That flag didn't come about until 1959. One other thing I can say about the flag, they went for the longest without any flag for the service. They had just a general flag. The Navy's flag used to have, like the small blue one over here, they just had a blue flag with a white diamond and a blue anchor. Uh, I was going to have one, but it hasn't arrived yet. But the, the Navy flag came from the first, uh, first seal of the Navy. So that's the history on that part. The next, next one, Marine Corps, excuse me, November 10th, 1775, is when they came into being. Now the flag did not come about 
until 1964, actually, is when the, this flag came out. Uh, the colors were designated back in 1925 of what they would be on the flag, but uh, the official flag did not come about until then. The Coast Guard, August 4th, 1790, is when the Coast Guard came into existence. Now then, when it first came out, it was designated, designated as Revenue Marines because they were sailing the coast. They had 10 ships that had been commissioned for sailing the coast and getting the tariffs from the uh, ships coming in from the seas. Yeah. Up until that time, privateering had been in existence, but uh, we started getting civilized, as it were, and they outlawed privateering, so they brought in the marine cutters. Later on, that was turned into the revenue cutter service, and then it came about being the Coast Guard. Now, the Coast Guard flag, excuse me, the current flag came into existence in 1964. The, uh, is modeled a whole lot after the first jacks that they actually had on the ship. It was not a flag, it was called a jack at that time. And that had just the eagle on there with the olive branch and the uh, arrows. And that's what they sailed at. Their saying is Semper Paratus, always ready. All right, then we go all the way over here. Now here's, here's where we get into a little bit of controversy because some people say the Merchant Marine was not a military branch. Unfortunately, people haven't studied history quite close enough because in 1957 they were given veteran status. One thing about the Merchant Marine in the Second World War, they had the highest casualty rate of any of the services. They were at war before anybody was. Their casualty rate was about 26%, well above any of the other military services. Okay, United States Air Force, they came about in uh, 1947, if they were split off from the Army Air Corps. Uh, they were made their own service, and they came up with their flag because their lightning fast is what they were saying, so there's lightning bolts on there, the eagle is overall is protecting the country, is protecting those underneath of it. Next to it is the Air National Guard flag, and that came into existence the same day the United States Air Force did because the Air Force came in, we already had the National Guard, National Guard people were flying in the Air Force and so they made a separate service out of that. Now the National Guard and the Air National Guard are state organizations to this day. However, in war, they could be called up to federal duty. And they have been, and in Vietnam, they paid a terrible toll. The National Guard paid dearly. And the last one just came into existence two years ago, December 20th, 2019, Space Force. And they had their flag out already when they came into existence when President Trump signed them into a nation, into a service, excuse me. They have uh, part of what was the Air Force's duties. They cover space and things from space. And also part of their assigned duties that most people don't realize is they're covering internet space. And it's part of the new stuff that they're covering. They're very highly technically evolved in the electronics. And so that is part of their, their duties. That's basically the military flags. Now, I brought the other one along because this kind of a pet of mine, I was a CV, and that is a CV flag there. It's actually a guide on from our MCBU 302, which was Reserve Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 302, of which I was a part for a while. Uh, it does depict what the Navy flag used to look like, basically squared instead of having the swallowtails. This is a guide on, actually, is what it's called. The POW flag came into it because uh, a lady had a son that was a POW, and she thought 
that it was tantamount that they be recognized. So in 1971, they formed an organization in order to honor our POWs and our Michigan action, of which there are still a monstrous amount out there. The flag was officially recognized in 1990, and it's an official flag that flies over all government installations now. It's, it's about as uh, sacred as the American flag anymore. Thanks, guys. That's it. That's it for that. Okay. Now then, we get into the other part. The first uh, flag that was really erected as, as being an American flag, although not officially. I got this little deep thing. <laughs> this, this is called a Grand Union flag. Some mistakenly call it Union flag. It's also known as a Congress flag, the Cambridge flag, and the first Navy ensign and it was the official First Navy Ensign. It was made up, it's called uh, from the Alfred flag, because it was flown on December 5th, 1776, by uh, Lieutenant John Paul Jones on the Alfred ship. Now, they don't know exactly how it was made up. They suspect that they took a British red ensign and put white stripes on it, because in the upper left corner you will see what is the British flag. Some people say it was copied from the British East India Company, but there was no proof on that one or the other. But this flag was also flown over Prospect Hill by General George Washington on the 1st of January, 1777. And that flag flew for a little over a year, a little about a year and a half, until the 14th of June in 1777, when it was replaced, I'm going to have to move some of these other flags. <laughs> Technical things go crazy, what can I say? Okay. It was replaced by that, the, the Bessie Ross flag. This was the first officially recognized flag of the United States of America. Now, the only thing that can really prove for fact that Bessie Ross had to do with this flag is the stars. Because when they first talked to her about making the flag, as the story goes, she being a poster and seamstress, she showed them how to make a five-pointed star with one snip of scissors. A six-pointed star was much harder to make. So they came up with a five-pointed star. There are different stories about who actually made the flag, the first one, who sewed it up. But uh, she is still credited with it, and she told her family about it, and her grandson in the 1800s took this to court, basically. But it was still never proven that she was the one that made this first flag. This is the first flag that was originally, officially recognized as representing the United States of America. After the Betsy Ross flag, we came into one of probably the most unique flags that we've ever had. If you will look at this one, you'll see that it has 15 stars and 15 stripes. That was due to two states being added to the Union. This flag service in 1795 and served until 1818. Vermont and Kentucky had been admitted to the Union and so they put on two more stars and two more stripes. Now between 1795 and 1818, there were also five other states added but they didn't put them on there yet. There was confusion on what to do. Finally, the Marine Service came up and said, look, if we keep putting stri stripes on, it's gonna be insignificant. So what we'll 
do is we'll go back to 13 stripes and put a start on every July 4th after a state is admitted to the Union. So in 1818, this flag was no more as far as the official flag. However, another story that goes along with this flag is quite interesting to me anyway. On September 6th, 1814, a gentleman by the name of William Biggins was arrested by Commander Ross from the uh, British Navy because he had been taking and getting uh, British subjects arrested and put in jail. Uh, never mind the fact that these British subjects were deserters from the Navy and the Army of the British Empire. They were going around stealing food from the farms around there. So William Beans found out about this and had them arrested. Well, they arrested him and took him to one of the British prisoner of war ships out in the uh, Bay of uh, Baltimore. Uh, a general, uh, excuse me, Colonel uh, John Stuart Skinner was the agent to actually go to the British and try to get the prisoners away from them. And they were usually successful. They went out there on the 6th of September in order to try to negotiate the release of William Beans along with some other prisoners. And he took along uh, a public attorney with him in order to help do the negotiation and take care of the legal formalities of it. And they did succeed, although it took them a week to So the British were going to let them go, but they said, look, we've got maneuvers that we've got to carry out, and you know too much. So they didn't allow them to go back to their sloop right then. They said, you've got to wait until we're done with our activity, and then we'll let you go. So on the morning of September 13th, 1814, the British started a bombardment of Fort McMahon. This bombardment went on until 7 o'clock of September, the next day. Now, can you imagine the cacophony of sound and noise and smoke from all these old cats? Well, the next morning when the sun came up, this young uh, attorney was also an amateur poet. He was looking up here, saw this flag, it was 30 feet tall, by 40 feet long, it's called a garrison flag. It was still flying over Fort McHenry. And that so inspired him that he sat down and he wrote a poem. Now, this poem, was pretty famous back then. A week later, after they were back on shore, he took this to a gentleman by the name of Thomas Carr. Mr. Carr put the poem to music. And actually, uh, I guess embarrassingly so, it was part of an old bar song. <laughs> but the title of the song was To an Acreon in Heaven. Now, it's, it's still a popular to this day, and I, I can lay money down here and be very confident that every one of you at least the first stanza to that poem. I'll, I'll lay money on it. Because it starts out, Oh, say, can you see? That young attorney was Francis Scott Key, and that's now, as of 1931, officially our national anthem. Thank you, Thank you all. I might point out to you too, if you look, you'll see a black streamer on here. For those of you that have a home that is permanent mount or angle mount on the front of your porch and you cannot board to half mast, this is the way you show half masting in the morning for the flag. It's a two and a half inch wide by five inch long streamer and it's attached to the hoist or the top of the flag. That shows morning, like you would have on Pearl Harbor Day, on upcoming Memorial Day. And that gives remembrance and memory and love to our country and our flag. Thank you all, appreciate it.
Yes, those can be purchased from the lady. You're right, John. Thank you. That black thing can be purchased from the Legion. Is that correct? From the American Legion. Which one? Which yeah, Legion? Our, we post them in our boat. You can get online. And any of them. Any of the Legions. Yeah. Okay, this is called a share session, so we'd like questions. I'm going to pose the first question for us, uh, Brian Brett Holt. My first question is, I want him to, just in two or three minutes, tell us what CBs, what a CB is, and the history of the CBs. They're very important. A construction battalion, once you conquer something, you really don't conquer it, you can't do something else. But describe the CBs and then you think of some questions about the flags and he knows most all of that. Okay. The CBs came about in the Second World War. We had uh, many bases overseas that were under construction. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, they found that the engineers, civilian engineers, could not themselves. Are we doing it again? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the civilian engineers could not defend themselves against attack. Uh, the first time they were found with a weapon, in the they could legally be shot as a spy. So it was decided by Admiral Ben Morrell, who at that time in charge of the yards and docks for the Navy, that they needed something else, some outfit that could go out and not build but were military trained and they could protect themselves. So they came up with the idea of the CBs and the CB stands for Construction Battalion. However, later on they decided they had to have a mascot. Well, Frankie Afarde drew up what is the CB, not I didn't bring a CB flag, I could have, but I did not. I, I didn't realize I was going into this. What the CBs do is we build. Anything and everything we build. Underwater, on the water, on land. We build wharfs, we build docks. Uh, McMurdo Sound in uh, the South Pole, the CBs built that. We've been in every major attack. Every major landing in the Second World War, the CBs were there. Sometimes beforehand, they were going in and taking out obstructions for the landings. They would go in and blow them up or tow them off if they could. They were very important in the uh, D-Day invasion and uh, supply thereafter because they helped what was turned into the mulberries, those floating uh, wharfs that were used to take the supplies into shore in, uh, in France. They went all the way through the South Pacific. At any one time during the Second World War, there were approximately 260,000 active duty CDs. Through the whole of the Second World War, there were only about 350,000 CDs. And they were spread all across the world, not only in the South Pacific, or the Pacific, but they were also in England, in France, in Germany. They marched into uh, Berlin. Uh, we've got a very proud history as far as it goes. We're a small unit, even smaller now. There's only about six active duty battalions out there. Their home bases were Davisville, Rhode Island, which has been decommissioned, Gulfport, Mississippi, and Fort Wayne, in California. Uh, Fort Wayne Indian and Gulf Fort are still in uh, active use. There is a museum at all three of those spots. If you ever get close to there, you might want to drop in and see because you can see and find out a whole lot more than ever I could tell you. But we have had one man named Marvin Shields who was a Congressional Medal of Honor winner. And that's because he gave up his life saving a bunch of his fellow Seabees in Vietnam. So that is a proud movement moment for the CBs. If you ever go to Arlington National Cemetery, when you start the drive in, the first thing you're going to see on the right hand side is the CB monument. And on that CB monument it says, with compassion, we build, we fight. And this is true. This is this is what the CBs do. We go out and we build, 
and we'll fight like hell to protect what we built. Anything else and everybody else along with it. A couple other things about CV said, so, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but in World War II, the average recruit age is about 18 or 19. The average age of a CB was 37. They would come in our town and take all the wing construction, all industrial contractors, take everybody and put them to work. Once you conquer, you have to have plumbing. Once you conquer, you have to have bridges. Once you conquer, you have to have all the infrastructure. And these guys supported the infrastructure. We found that out in World War II. If you didn't have construction guys that knew what they were doing, it didn't happen. We've had a talk here with Mr. Guerin. He was a principal in Boonville. He just died about two years ago when he was a CB. We have another talk where I think on May 18th or, or June 18th named Richard Colodi, and he was in the Solomon Islands, and he's only 97. He's a very good speaker, and he's gonna talk about what the CBs did in the Solomon Islands. So the CBs are very important. I knew nothing about them for a long period of time, but Brian's taught me a lot, and I think most of you know more. Now, other questions about flags that you've created in your minds over the last few minutes that you may have for Brian? Okay, speak it now, repeat it. Louder! Yes! Alright folks, can you tell me what criteria are met for the federal government to fly a flag half staff? And how long is it required to fly a half staff? Okay, the gentleman asked what the criteria is flying the American flag at half step according to the, the federal government. Those criteria do vary depending on the uh, state of the person. The president can have it flown up to seven days or more until their funeral. Uh, as we've had, uh, like Madeline Albright was uh, with the UN, uh, they usually have them for three days Congressman and Senator, three days or until they are interred. Uh, Supreme Court Justice is until they are interred. Uh, and it does vary. The ordering of the flag to half staff uh, can only be done by a governor of a state or higher. A mayor cannot order the flag to be flown half staff on a general notion. I know they have done so and they've been flown at half staff within their city limits. But to get down to honest facts, they cannot honor, uh, excuse me, order an American flag to be flown at half staff. <coughs> Pardon me, please. Uh, it has to be a governor or higher. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Other question? Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Y'all repeat. Y'all repeat. I don't hear well. Let me see if I can work on what you're doing. Tell her to say her name. My name is Carol, and I just want to know what's the best way to dispose of a worn out flag. Carol wanted to know the best way to dispose of a worn out American flag, and I'm glad she brought that up because I forgot to say something. There are a number of easy ways to do it. It's called the VFW, American Legion, Boy Scouts of America. You can give a worn out flag to almost any of those organizations and they will properly dispose of it. If you decide you want to dispose of it yourself, to retire it is actually what it's called. It's quite easy. There are a number of ways. Title IX flag code of the United States recommends burning. Now this is not just throwing it on the ground. This is having a fire lit and being solemn about it. Because you are retiring a piece of history. Something that stands well over 200 years of history of our great nation. What they recommend is to have a good fire lit. Most of the time on a lot of ceremonies they will soak that in uh, fuel oil or kerosene, diesel. Never gas, that stuff explodes. And slowly load the flag into the fire. 
and stand solemnly until it's consumed by the fire. There will be grommets left afterwards. The recommended way to take care of that is take those grommets, tie them together, and go to a body of water and give them a water burial. Did that, that answer your question? Interesting. Anybody else? Sir. Okay, if you're if you're going to fly a flag at night, what time is it about? It should be lit. You should have a light on that. Part. If light is not lit, it should not be flown. That's that's the simplest way to put that. Yes, sir. Actually, that's kind of a gray area. Uh, he said uh, in his case there's a street light across the street. That is kind of an area. Most of the time they recommend that you have a, a light dedicated to that flag, illuminated anytime that it's dark. Um, they're not going to have the flag police come out and arrest I promise you that. They got, they got a lot better things to do than that. But uh, generally speaking, the best way to do it is to have a light on that flag. Okay? That answer your question? Okay, now there's a, a law on the books that a lot of people don't realize. Desecrating an American flag, as some protesters like to do, is throw it on the ground and stomp on it that. Actually, they can be fined a thousand dollars for that. But find a judge that's going to do it. Not going to happen, folks. What I what I do on something like that, I I have to cry about it when I see it on TV. It bothers me tremendously. Uh, if I was at a situation like that, a friend of mine was, and he went up and pushed the protesters down and took the flag. And I I want to mess with him because he was a former SEAL. <laughs> that flag back there is 48 stars. One great big one hanging. 48, so that, I'm going to wait until 1949 or so, when we put in Alaska or, or uh, Hawaii, and then Hawaii in 58. 58, so we got 50. 1958 is when Hawaii went in, 59 is when Alaska went in. That, that is the second flying American flag. Uh, the 50 star flag has now usurped that. But that flag flew over two wars. The First World War and the Second World War and Korea. So there is a huge amount of history in those flags. No question, any other questions? Okay, thank you for coming today. Just, it sounds like it's raining outside. Want your hair to take care of, we'll valet you to your car. The, uh, Jack Buttram has something to say. Okay, uh, they have a quilt over there you can sign and, and then you can donate money if you want and that, that uh, when we wrap that up, maybe win it uh, and it may be displayed here, but uh, love to have you sign that. They've done a lot of work in that, that quilt. I want to thank the line dancers for doing all the work that they, it really spices the place up. Uh, we were going to have the Rockettes, but they didn't show and we got a better show than the Rockettes, so. The next talk I have on your table, and so you don't have to talk to my wife all the time, this is the talk, if you sign up, we've got something to sign up here. This is my wife, her name is Jennifer, so she probably knows most of you by telephone. But anyway, if you sign up today, then she doesn't have to call you every five minutes. Uh, if you don't sign up, she'll call you. So you'll be getting some phone calls. So she doesn't like that tape recorder, she wants a person. Uh, but this is next month, this is a really gonna be good, it's got a help, it's going to be by three different chaplains that are very senior and know a lot about how chaplains deal with uh, the people on duty after they get out of duty and then later on in life. And I think it's 12 minutes each. One will be on Zoom. The other two will be here in person. They're uh, high-ranking and uh, done a lot of work with uh, individuals. 
uh, from the chaplain viewpoint. What else have I forgot? Well, as we sign up, which I have names, what is really helpful for me is, and some of you are already doing this, and I can spot you in the crowd, you call, you text me or email me and say, put us down. And even though you've signed up, it helps me because I want to reconfirm before the next event because things happen. You know, if you have doctor's appointments, they get sick. So the more you contact me first, even though you've signed up, it gives me an idea of the number, I still would love if you could make a call either into my email or you could call the War Museum. Forrest here, where's Forrest? There he is, he gives me the names of the people who have called in there with the reservation. Because that last week I'm making a lot of calls if I've not had contact with anybody yet. So that just helps us get a true number, okay? She's, grow she's growing a little halo on her head. So if you see that halo, it's getting bigger all the time. She's had to live with me for a lot of years. That's a big thing. She's going to heaven. I don't know why I am, but she's going to heaven. Any other questions? She asked how many years. We've been married three years. No, it's 37 years, two months, three hours, seven minutes, and four seconds. You want anything more exact? All right, any other questions? Line dancers, thank you. You just, you set the place off today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.